Hello and welcome to another Cinema 4D tutorial. My name is Ricardo Silva and today I'm going to show you the complete process of creating something that looks like the animated text that I have on screen. Right now I am in After Effects and I have the render movie of the title that we're planning to do this time and I want you to take a look at this title and you will see that there are several important parts that make up this title. The first and most important part is the animated texture that is on the word film in the beginning and then it becomes red at the end. The second part is how the title basically unfolds into the screen to go into position. And the last thing would be the letters coming towards the screen one at a time and then disappearing behind the screen. So the first thing that we're going to be doing with this film title is starting from the last part over here, which is using the MoGraph tools in Cinema 4D Lite to animate this text title. Later on, we're going to start creating the animated texture and also the bending of our element to fall into screen. So let's go ahead and create a new project and I go to After Effects, under File, go to the New menu and select Maxon Cinema 4D File. I'm going to call it the Film Tools Trailer Text in here. I'm going to save it and Cinema 4D Lite should open for you. One thing that I have noticed is that in this version 21 or After Effects 2020, when you open Cinema 4D Lite, the actual project that you created is not open by default or automatically. So I have to go back to After Effects and then select the Cinema 4D file and again do an edit and select Edit Original. By doing that, now I have the correct empty project loaded into Cinema 4D Lite. In here, we're going to be creating then the MoGraph animation that we found at the end. But before I create that, let me show you that our logo is composed of two different title elements, which means film is color red and tools is color black. So in order for me to create this title, I'm going to have to separate these two elements in the uh, Cinema 4D light and then put them together. Also, you will notice that the letter T goes on top of the letter M. So that is one of the reasons why I'm going to have to create these two words as two separate elements. But then I'm going to join them together so I can animate them as a whole entire piece. Let's go back to Cinema 4D. To create the text, I'm going to select the splines menu and select my text splines. And then I'm going to type in my first letter, which would be film. Then I'm going to select the font that I need. I'm going to be using Arial Bold Italic. So I select my font and the style is going to be Bold Italic. Now for this part of the text, I'm going to make it aligned to the right. That way the letter M is all the way to the center of my 3D environment. I'm going to make a duplicate of that text by selecting the text in the object manager, pressing my command or control key, click and drag to create a new one. Notice how the arrow shows a little square with a plus sign in, inside of the square. That means if I let go the mouse right now, I'm going to create a duplicate of that text. And indeed, I have a text that one in my object manager. I'm going to change the alignment to the left on this particular element. And of course, I'm going to change the text content in here to the word tools. I am going to double click and make sure that I rename this to the corresponding names that contains in the text so I don't get confused. Now whenever I create spline text like this, I choose to go to one of the orthographic views. In this case, I'm going to click on the little square button at the top of my perspective window and go to the front. Right here, I am working on a 2D environment, something similar to Illustrator or any 2D application. 
The reason why I want to do that is because in the word tools that I have selected right now, I'm going to enable the kerning, the show 3D GUI button. This button allows me to create manual kerning on my words. To select a particular letter to do kerning, I can go into the little square that is at the top of the letter and then move it left or right. That way I can do an individual type of setting for my kerning. If I click on the letter L over here, I can do kerning on that. Notice that when I do the kerning on the letter L, also the S goes with it. So anything that is on the right side of that particular letter will move along to, with the letter. That's the reason why I started with the S in the beginning. If I click on the O, I can do exactly the same thing. I can move it back and forth and do the kerning manually so it visually feels balanced. Now that I'm done with this, make sure that I do deselect the Show 3D GUI because you don't want to have those gadgets when you're working with text because you probably accidentally may move it and you don't want to do that. I'm going to click on the film text and I'm going to get closer to it a little bit here in my interface. Now the film is aligned to the right. The same thing, the same principle appears in here, which I enabled the Show 3D GUI, so I have to start from the right to control the kerning between the M and the L. So I select the letter M first, and then I move it to the left, and notice that when I'm doing that, the FIL is the one moving, because the alignment for this particular text element is to the right, so it's always keeping the right side fixed. If I click on the letter L, then I can do some kerning in there, and I can do the letter I. Excellent. For the letter F, I want to show you a couple of options that you may have. In some cases, some titles might have the first letter a little larger than the other letters. So with the gadgets that appear here in the Show 3D GUI option for the text, we can create something different than what the actual text is giving us. For example, if you go to the top right side of these gadgets, you will notice a little triangle that is related to the scale of the letter. So if I click and drag my mouse, you will notice that I am proportionately increasing the size or the scale of this character. Of course, if you want to deform the character, you can go to the arrows that are here at the top right of the character. The one pointing up is going to give you the possibility of deforming this in a vertical fashion. And if you go to the right arrow, then you can deform it to the right side as well. The little triangle down at the bottom here, this is kind of like the baseline on any typography setting. So you can create something that looks completely different to the other letters that you have in here, and of course, you can always go back to the previous letter and kern it a little more if you want to. Right now, the letter F has been completely deformed or changed to look completely different than the other text, as you can see there. In the case that you want to kind of like go back and revert to the original shape, then we have to look a little more into the actual parameters of the Show 3D GUI. If you notice, there is a little arrow in here that you can click and then expose the actual element that you're working with. The start and end indicates that you are working in the first character of this text spline. If I change the number to 1 to 2, notice that it changed to the letter I. And if I change it to number 2, then it goes to the next letter and so forth. So every single letter has an ID that you can control via the parameters. I am in character number one right now, and I can control many of the aspects of its deformation, like the horizontal scale, vertical scale, using the parameters. If you want to be specific about entering the numbers in here, you can actually do that. Also, at the bottom, you can say either reset all of the characters or reset the selected character that you have right now. In this case, I want to go back to the original form of the letter F, so I'm going to select the Reset Selected right here, and then the letter F goes back to its default state. 
Now that I am happy with my kerning, I can close this and disable the Show 3D GUI, and now I have my text perfectly set up. In the tools over here, noted that still there is some gaps between the letters, so I can do some horizontal spacing if I wanted to. This is like, like an overall tracking or kerning, okay? So you can do that if you want to. Now, if you remember, I was talking about the letter T being on top of the letter M or very close to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the word film and move it just a tiny bit in there, maybe like six centimeters. And then I will take the letter tools or the word tools and I'm going to move it and place it right on top of the letter M, just like the logo is supposed to be. At this moment, I'm going to add a uh, extrude generator, which is the one that is going to help me create the geometry for these two objects. So I'm going to bring one and then another one, and I'm going to rename them already here. So I'm going to call this film and this one tools. Now I am going to take the spline that corresponds to the film, and I'm going to put it as a child of the film. And notice that I have an arrow pointing down to square, which means that if I let go the mouse right now, it will be the child of the film extrude object. So once I do that, notice that there is now a hierarchy of the film extrude object, and the child is the text object. I'm going to do exactly the same to the tools text object, and I'm going to place it inside of the tools. Now that I have these two extrude objects, I can either modify one or modify two at the same time. And because these two objects are exactly the same object, they are using the default parameters at this moment. I can select both of them and then modify the parameters and both objects will deform the same way. So one of the things that I want to do right now is to increase the movement, which is the extrude amount. You will notice that in front of the movement, there are three fields in here, and the last field contains a number 20 in there. These three fields correspond to the X, to the Y, and to the Z axis. And if you notice the axis here in the objects, you will see that the blue axis pointing backwards is the one that is being used to extrude the object. So that means that you have to select the axis for the extrusion depending how your spline is being placed in the 3D environment. So right now I'm going to make this about 40 centimeters deep, so it's a nice thick word. At this moment you can go to the caps and then start playing with the bevels. If I increase the size of the bevel in here, it will stop at one given point but also in the back of my text, the same bevel is being applied. Actually, I do not want to have the same bevel in the front as in the back. I want to have them separately. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enable the separate bevel controls. And remember, I'm doing the same exact parameter changes to both of these extrude objects. I am going to see the start bevel and the end bevel categories in here. So in the start bevel, I'm going to go to the segments and lower that to number one. That is going to give me a very nice chisel look that I can really enjoy seeing right here in the letter S. For the back bevel, I'm going to use just a simple bevel that is not going to be probably more than one centimeter and it's going to be also flat. So I'm going to lower the segments to one. Remember that I could have used a preset by clicking on the load preset and select one of these or in the back the same way. The only thing that I need to manipulate is right here where the letter T is touching the top of the letter M. What I'm going to do is select only the tools object, the extrude object in here, and use the Z axis of that element and move it forward a few centimeters so the text comes out and exposes itself. It's a very minimum detail, but it makes a whole big difference when we are looking at the object. Now, the next thing that we want to create is two materials. To do the materials, I'm going to go to the Material Manager, double-click one time, and then, of course, double-click another time in an empty space in here. And I'm going to call this one the Film, and this one Tools. So it corresponds 
to this plane that I'm applying the material. I'm going to double click on the icon for the film so I get the material editor as a floating window. On the left side we can see that we have all the channels available to apply or create our material. The color channel which is checked by default. That means this is the channel that is enabled as well as the reflectance. I'm going to use the color and I'm going to use the red color. But this red color might not be exactly the same color as the color for the logo. If I want to use an image as a reference, I can go into the area where I can load a color from a picture. So I click on this little button and then I will look for that picture right here by clicking on these three little dots. I have the image reference right here on my computer and I click open. Once I click open, I take this element that I have in the center and I put it on top of a red letter. I can create another little dot by clicking on the add color and then this color I will move it to the letter that has a dark color in there. So now I have a palette that contains the exact colors pulled out from this image that I'm using as a reference. I'm going to select the red color which is this one and I'm just going to close the material editor. To apply the color to the film object I just take it and I drag it either I put it on top of the word film or I just take it and put it on top of the film extrude object in the object manager. Once I do that then I have the color applied to that object. I will do exactly the same to the tool so I'm going to double click, select the second color and then close the material editor and apply it to the word tools. And either of those two ways I have applied the material to the extrude objects as you can see in the object manager. So now that I have the entire text all created, I need to kind of like group them together so I can make them one big object and then use my MoGraph tool to animate every single letter individually. So the first thing that I need to do is create a null object which I pull out from the geometric shapes that I have in here and that null object I'm going to call it by double clicking on its name as text. And of course I'm going to take my two objects in here and place them and make them a child or children of the text. Now that I have the text as one single hierarchy I'm going to bring my MoGraph element which is called the fracture. I will take the text object or the text hierarchy and place it inside of the fracture. So right now the fracture is looking at the text hierarchy as one single object. So how do I know that I'm actually creating this as a uh, single object? Well if I click on the fracture object and I look at the mode you will notice that it says straight. Straight mode basically what it is is that it takes everything that is underneath the fracture object and it will look at every single individual hierarchy as one object. To prove that I'm going to apply a uh, random effector to the fracture and the way that the random effector works is that it will take every individual object and then randomize its position. So I'm going to go into my MoGraph elements in here and I'm going to select the random. The random is not applied to the fracture object yet because I didn't have the fracture object selected. So what I'm going to do is go to the fracture and under the effectors tab notice that there is no effectors and I'm going to take the random effector and drag it and put it right there. Once I do that you will notice that my text moved completely. I'm going to go into the random effector under the parameter attributes and you will notice that the position is, has some values. What this means is that the random parameter or the random effector will randomize the position in plus and minus 50 in the x position, plus or minus 50 in the y position and plus or minus 50 in the z position. I'll do exactly the same thing to the rotation so I enable the rotation and I can do this as well so it's going to randomize in between minus and plus 47 degrees. Now because the fracture is looking at this object as one single object 
I don't see any randomness. It just feels like I'm rotating the text. But when I change the mode of the fracture object under the object tab from straight to explode segments, now you will see that every single letter is being randomized around. I'm going to select the explode segments and connect because that is a better mode whenever you have text inside a fracture object. Now one thing that you may notice is that it created some roundness and some shadows that are not necessarily very appealing. If I disable the fracture element for a moment, can you see that the letter M is nice and chiseled, very defined shape? But when I enable the fracture element, now everything kind of like became a little softer and rounder and it doesn't look that appealing that, than before. The reason for that is because our font tag has been adapted to something that now is connected by the fracture object. To do that, I am going to select both of these font tags so I can modify them at the same time. And then I'm going to lower the angle from 60 to something lower. So I can dial in or I can go really low, like for example 10, or increase it if I see that there is some weird shapes. So I think 20 degrees on this particular example is going to work perfectly fine for every single letter. The font tag is one of those shading algorithms that allows you to smooth out surfaces that they need a little improvement. So I might increase or decrease the value. So I'm going to leave it about 25 and it seems like it's working fine for every single letter. Perfect. Now with the random effector that we applied, notice that we control the randomness of our letters by modifying the values in our parameters under the parameter tab of the random effector. I can disable the random effector by clicking on the check mark over here and the text is going to go back to its original position. I can also disable the random effector by going into the fracture under the effectors tab and clicking the check mark that is in front of the random name. Or I can reduce the amount of randomness by moving this slider that controls how much of this random is being applied. Now this slider goes from 0 to 100, but if I use the arrows that are contained within this little field, I can go beyond 100, so the randomness continues. So this is something that I could animate really easily, or I can go into the negative values, and then the randomness is going to go in the opposite direction. At this moment I'm going to get rid of the random, because the random is something that we're not going to be using. I'm going to use something called the plane effector. So I'm going to select the fracture because this time I'm going to select the plane effector and I want that plane effector to be added automatically to the effectors under the effector tab of the fracture object. You will notice that if I go back to the fracture under the effectors I have the plane effector already in there. Now the plane effector is controlling the movement and transformation of my text. So if I go to the parameter tab of the plane effector, you will notice that by default the position has been enabled. And the position of the text is controlled here in the plane effector by moving these parameters. I can do it in the x-axis, in the y or the z-axis. And if I enable, for example, the scale and I start modifying the scale, you will notice that I am modifying every single element using the scale tool or I can click on the uniform scale and then I can make every single element really tiny if I wanted to. Or I can enable the rotation and so forth and notice that this is not a random effector, this is just doing the transformation under the parameter in a very plain manner which is exactly what I want, but I want to show you the power that this simplicity is going to give us in just a moment. So of course, none of these values are relevant to our animation. So one of the things that I'm going to do is disable the scale over here, so I don't want to change the scale. I may not want to change the rotation at this moment, and I do want to change the position. So what I'm going to do, as an example, I'm going to type in zero on the X, and I'm going to move in the y-axis like around 200 
units up and in the z-axis I'm going to type in zero. So now my plane effector actually is doing this movement for me, moving the text all the way up. The power that I have behind the plane effector, besides doing this in a very controllable way, is under the fall off tab. In the fall off tab we have a set of elements that are called the fields. These fields can be found right here in this menu. Also they are available in the fall off tab. So I'm going to use the spherical field. Notice that every single letter went down to the original position except the letter T. If I take that spherical field, which now it is inside of my object manager, and I use the x-axis tool, notice that when I move it around, then applies the effect to the actual letter. If the letter is outside of that force field that you see there, then the letter is not going to get any effect whatsoever. If I move my perspective in this way, and I move this all the way back there, notice that the field is not near any text. So even if I move it here, there is not going to be any effect. So you have to think about 3D positioning of your field in order to affect your letters. So the closer I get to the actual letter, then it will affect it. Otherwise, it will not. Okay, so this is nice. You can make the text jump around, but this is not exactly the effect that we want. So we click on the field in the object manager, and then we go under the field tab, and then the type that we selected was spherical, but we can change it right now to make it something like a linear field. So you will notice that everything that is on the right side of the linear field is being affected by the plane effector and everything that is on the left side of that field is not being affected unless I move my field around back and forth. So you will notice that this probably is the field that I need to use in order to create the animation that I saw in my movie. So to do that, notice that I can rotate or change the aspect of this field as well. Right now, the letters are falling very linearly, like so, but I can increase the size right here under the length. I can increase the length of my field. That means that from the beginning of this little gadget over here, which is a square with a grid, and to the other one, that is kind of like the range of smoothness of how it changes from not having the effect to having the effect. So the letters will be a little more together falling at the same time. I can change the length within the interface by grabbing the little the yellow dots in the field and now notice that I am moving the slider without actually touching my parameters. So I am doing it right here in the perspective window. And by doing that, notice that now uh, the range of transition between no effect and yes effect is a little shorter than before. Therefore, every single letter seems to be jumping one at a time. So this range will allow you to create a smoother transition from having no effect on the text and having the full effect on the text. If I go back to the plane effector and I change the parameter tab to change the position, so I'm going to type in zero on the Y and I'm going to make my Z position in the negative value probably around a thousand. Now, if I move the field back and forth, you will see that my text is falling down from left to right. If I want to make the effect to be in the opposite direction, meaning that the, the words are in that position and then the letter F comes in first towards the camera, then I'm going to have to change the effect right now. So I go back to the linear field and then in the direction under the field tab, I will change it to minus. By doing that, then I can easily animate my linear field from the left to the right and then I achieve the animation that I'm looking for. Now, in the final render that I show you, we had a camera. So at this moment, I think it would be a great idea to create a camera. So I'm going to 
position my perspective window in a distance that I feel is going to be perfect for my camera to be. I go to the camera menu and I select the camera and then I click on the camera and go to the coordinate step and I want to make sure that it's perfectly in the center on the x-axis. Uh, on the y maybe I am going to put it about 35 and then in the z-axis I'm going to put it minus 1500 which is kind of like far away. I'm going to look through the camera by clicking on this little button so now I am looking through that camera. If I want to go even further back I can move the z-axis something like this. I'm going to leave it at 1600 which I think it feels a little more uh, white space around my logo and also I'm going to change the orientation and make everything in zero degrees so the camera is actually looking straight into the object. If I go to the other views, the orthographic views that I have in here, I can see the little triangle that represents the camera pointing at my object on the top view and this square on the front view is my camera and also this little triangle on the right view is pointing at the camera. So I think my camera is positioned perfectly where I want it so I don't want to move it accidentally and I will select the camera, go to the tags in this menu and I'm going to go to the rigging tags and select the protection tag so I don't move it accidentally. If I want to navigate around the scene I get out of my camera and then I can move around and then look at the element from any angle that I want including I can see the camera in here. Anytime that I want to see through that camera, I just click on this button and then I am back into the camera. But I cannot navigate using this camera because I have the protection tag. Alright, so I think that feels really good. Now let's try doing our animation for the linear field. So if I move this linear field like so, notice that the text doesn't reach the behind the camera position. So what that means is that I'm going to put my field in here I'm going to go to the plane effector and maybe increase the parameter transform on the z-axis to be a little for the back. So maybe around 16 or 1700 in the negative value. So now if I were to move the linear field back and forth, you will see that the text actually goes behind the camera. And we can see that very clearly when we look at it from the bird's eye point of view from the perspective window. Perfect. I think we are achieving what we want. The only thing that I want to add is the animation of my field from left to right. So this type of animation was created at the end of the duration of our movie that I rendered. That movie was 300 frames in duration so I'm going to have to change the duration of this project to be also 300 frames. Right now, if you notice, it starts at 0 and it ends at 90. So I'm going to go to the edit and go to project settings. The shortcut is command D or control D. And then in my attributes, I can see that I have frames per second and also the entire range. So I'm going to type in 24 frames per second because this is going to be for film. And I'm going to do the maximum time to be 300 frames. So when I do that, notice that my range stayed where it was. So I can modify the range in here with the preview range to be the full length of my duration or I can type it in here as well. Now before I go anywhere else, I'm going to go to my render settings over here and I'm going to change the frame rate to 24. So this number over here matches the frames per second of my project. I want to make sure that those two numbers are exactly the same to avoid any confusion internally in the math for calculating the frame rate. Now I'm going to make the animation starting at frame 0 on the linear field. So if I want to see what parameter I should be keyframing, I'm going to move the red axis in here and you will notice that it is the actual px parameter under the coordinate step. So I'm going to add a keyframe manually on the px and I'm going to move my timeline indicator let's say to frame 80 or something like that and I'm going to move that 
arrow all the way to the right until the text is all animated like so and it's about 450 and then I will click in that keyframe and now I have a motion pad now if I press the rewind button over here and then I play back you will notice that the animation is doing exactly what I want let's take a look at it from the inside of the camera and uh, let's rewind and play back it might feel a little too fast so I can grab the last keyframe that I find in here by clicking on that keyframe the keyframe becomes yellow so now I can move it and maybe put it in around 120 or something like that go back to the beginning and play back and now it feels a little smoother than before I think that speed is something that I like so I'm going to keep now the problem that I have is that I created my animation in the beginning of the timeline from 0 to 113 or 14 over here I could move those two keyframes right here in the mini timeline but I'm going to go to my layouts and I'm going to select the first layout that I have available there which is the animate layout by doing that it will take me to the dope sheet and I'm going to put my mouse on top of the timeline over here and press the letter H so I can see the entire contents of that timeline which in this case is the two keyframes I'm going to press my option key and press my right side button so I can zoom out and using my middle mouse button I can press and move like so so basically I'm using the same navigation shortcuts as I use in my perspective window now that I have all of these keyframes selected I can grab the yellow bar and move them at the same time all the way to the end to the frame 300 so that means that now I have changed the position of my keyframes in the timeline from the beginning of the time to the end of the time now if I rewind and then I play back it's going to stay there for a little while only until the timeline indicator reaches that point then it will start animating and then that would be the end of our animation I think I achieved that perfectly fine now it's time for me to add a little more interest to this animation I will do that by going back to my standard layout right here from the top and then in the plane effector I may want to add some other elements that I didn't add before the only parameter that we are animating is the z-axis but we could add rotation and by adding rotation I can manipulate how much I want to add for this animation at the end so if I move my timeline indicator from uh, the point that starts the animation you will notice that the letters are twisting and turning around just because in the plane effector I enable the rotation parameter one thing that I would like to have is that the letter T and the letter uh, M they are a little too close to the camera maybe they should be a little lower when they are close to the camera so in the plane effector I'm going to tweak under the parameter tab the Y value of that animation so I'm going to lower the Y probably around 25 or something like that let me see I think a little more so I'm going to go really low probably like a hundred and I think that would be just fine alright so let's play back the entire animation in the beginning there is nothing happening and then we get the final animation which I'm really happy with it okay so I am very happy with that set and now let's go to the second part of our tutorial